Welcome back, Almost Impossible listeners. You're listening to the second part of our two-parter on the history of Las Vegas. Last episode, we talked a lot about how flood control, the New Deal, and a really terrible worker village called Boulder City uh, created the precursors for Vegas. Uh, But today, we're going to take you from that, right, a burgeoning city created by the Hoover Dam in the 1930s, to the Vegas that we know today. Um, And though we've probably all heard about Vegas, have a sense of Vegas, have probably been to Vegas, it's worth taking a step back and just realizing how much of an outlier Vegas is. And Craig, you dug up a couple of facts and I was just like mind blown to be like, oh yeah, we're talking about a city that is like very much an outlier compared to all the cities, not just in America, but like the world. 50 million people a year visit Vegas. Half of Americans have been to Vegas. That's about as many as have passports. The 10 largest hotels in America are in Vegas. Vegas has more hotel rooms than New York City, LA, Chicago, any city in America. (laughs) And moreover, all of that happened in the past 100 years. Yeah, it's completely crazy. And so if the motivating question of episode one in this two-parter was, why do cities exist in the first place? The one for this episode is, how does a city become like a globally recognized brand that, you know, other places want to copy, so many people have been to, like is significant in this way? And also, how does it stay ahead, Mm -hmm. right? Because other people and other entrepreneurs saw Vegas happening and really only Macau has been able to compete with Vegas in Vegasness. Right. <laughs> and this is going to be a really different kind of story. You know, episodes that you've listened to before in Almost Impossible, right? We've talked about the Manhattan Project. We've talked about the Wright Brothers, right? These are all stories of these kind of very specific sorts of innovation. We're talking about the kind of creation of a city here, right? And so it'll look and feel quite different. And I think one of the things we'll get to as we go through the story is talking about the degree to which these are similar kinds of almost impossible things or pretty different kinds of almost impossible things. And so basically the arc of this story is going to kind of take you from World War II all the way up until early 2000s modern Vegas. And it's going to be bookmarked with various entrepreneurs having their own inspiration, their own vision of Vegas, and their own vision of what's possible here. Cool. Let's get into it. Hey, I'd just like to take a quick moment to thank our sponsor, Protocol Labs Ventures. Protocol Labs Ventures invests in startups across Web3, as well as those building on the Protocol Labs stack, which includes technologies like IPFS, Filecoin, and LibP2P. Protocol Labs Ventures also invests in companies pursuing breakthroughs in computing, which includes things like brain-computer interfaces. If you're a founder looking to raise a round in one of these areas, you can email funding at protocol.ai. And Tim and I would also like to thank Cola Buskirk for helping us research and tell this story. All right, Tim. So the beginning of the strip goes like this. So they say. So they say, which, yeah, we should say uh, Las Vegas is all about perpetuating the myth of Las Vegas. And so are we today. <laughs> 1940, a guy named Tom Hall, California hotel developer, traveling between Vegas and Los Angeles allegedly gets a flat tire outside of Vegas. As he's fixing his flat tire on the side of the highway, he looks around and he's like, man, there are a lot of people driving by me. Maybe I should build something here to serve all of these people. So he buys 57 acres for $57,000 and he begins construction of El Rancho. So El Rancho is gonna be one of the earliest versions of the Las Vegas casino hotel and actually it's going to have the seeds of a lot of the things that will continue on in vegas tradition water features it's going to have a great one it's going to allegedly pull 10 million gallons from las vegas's aquifer every month just to feed all of the water features in el rancho it's going to have a swimming pool right next to the highway which great which is great. It's is very attractive to people at the time, and it works because people are coming. They're booked from the very beginning. It's going to have, importantly, a casino, although casino is perhaps a little bit generous because it will be one craps table, two blackjack tables, and one roulette wheel for a 200-plus room casino. And we should say uh, over the course of this episode, the hotels and the hoteliers contrast their hotels by number of rooms. That's how they rank them. Yeah, and this is an important part about uh, like the architecture of these early hotels. So there's another one that opened a few years later called The Last Frontier that actually has very much kind of the same model, right? It's like a hotel resort. 
and there's kind of a casino, but it's like tucked away in the back, right? It's like not a feature of sort of like the the building of these resorts at the time. And these resorts at the time are going to lean on the Western aesthetic, you know, Last Frontier, El Rancho. They're going to be people walking around who work for the hotel, literally with six shooters on their belts. You know, it's kind of that like wagon wheel chandelier vibe. All of that stuff that maybe we consider a little hokey now, that's going to be the aesthetic at the time. And it's going to be really popular. You know, this is a resort that is booked from the moment it's open, right? And it's it's largely booked because it's in a great location. It's located very conveniently between Vegas and LA. It captures a lot of traffic moving along the highway. It's a good business. Hull is operating it. He opens in 1941. In 1943, he receives kind of an unusual visit. These two guys show up. Uh, at El Rancho, this guy, Meyer Lansky, and this other guy, Bugsy Siegel. Um, And they introduce themselves as businessmen from New York. And what they want to do is they want to buy El Rancho, buy a stake in El Rancho. And Hull, in a very kind of, you know, idealistic way, says, you know, the people of Vegas have been too good to me. I can't sell. And probably, you know, maybe spoken um, not so explicitly as, and you guys are gangsters, and it seems like it'd be really dangerous to get into business with you. Okay, but but wait, Tim, like, let's not jump into it too fast. Why are mobsters even showing up in Vegas and trying to buy hotels or at least a stake in the hotel in the 40s? Yeah, so this is actually, you're right, completely weird, right? Lansky and Siegel could have been doing all sorts of other criminal stuff in New York, but they went out of their way to jump into their car, take what appears to be a cross-country road trip to just visit this kind of middling roadside casino. Yeah. So to understand why, you have to understand a little bit about how the war, which is happening now, it's the 1940s, is shaping not just the legit economy, right? So, for example, Nellis Air Force Base opens up around Vegas uh, in this period. Um, The war economy is, you know, bringing a lot of sort of economic activity to places like Vegas. Um, But you also have to understand how the war is shaping the illegit economy as well. So Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel, to give a little background about them, they run one of the most sort of active, most violent smuggling gangs in New York. They made their fortune during Prohibition, moving alcohol across the border. Um, And with the end of Prohibition, um, they got into the narcotics business, right? You're good at smuggling one thing, so just try smuggling another thing, right? Sort of a crime logic. And at the time, a lot of the trade in narcotics moved east-west, right? So you'd have a lot of drugs coming in from across the Atlantic, from Europe into New York. Uh, and you also have a lot of activity in East Asia as well, right? Drugs moving out of East Asia and then coming in through the West Coast. And so for Siegel and Lansky, this is great business for them. They're already based in New York. They have all the connects on the waterfront. Why wouldn't you want to get into the narcotics business? But World War II really changes the game if you happen to be in the mob, right? Suddenly, there's battleships There's submarines operating in the Atlantic. Uh, The government is a lot more careful about security on the waterfront than they used to be. So trade, the supply chain of narcotics is interrupted. And so Lansky and Siegel start looking for alternatives, right? They got to keep moving drugs in order to make money. And so slowly what starts to happen is that the movement of these illicit goods shifts from east to west um, to north to south, right? They start moving across the U.S.-Mexico border, right? Um, and one of the reasons that they're in Vegas is that you draw the sort of Venn diagram of crime and you're like, well, Vegas is a great stopping point. It's not far from the border. And also it's pretty close to LA and connected by highway, right? The highways that the Hoover Dam helped create. Okay. But just to be clear, they do the gambling thing too. So in the forties, Nevada is going to legalize horse betting and Lancey's going to start the preeminent wire service for managing all of these bets. And in a short period of time, he'll be extorting about $25,000 a week from these casinos to run this bookmaking service. And I think gambling is sort of interesting when you think about the illicit economy, because there's the front end, right, which is gambling is a great business. And around this time, I think one of the important things is that sort of so-called legitimate money investors don't really want to get into the gambling business. They don't want to invest in casinos. And so the mob has a good time getting in here because they're kind of the only game in town. But it's also the back office of gambling, which is really of interest to the mob as well, because it turns out that casinos are just a great venue for money laundering. turns out when you're in narcotics, you get money through extortion, you end up with like a lot of dirty money on your hands and you need some way to clean that up. And the great thing about casinos is that it's largely a cash business. 
So the way the scam works is you take some of the legitimate money that's coming in from gamblers coming in the door, and then you take some of the illegitimate money from you know selling narcotics, and you mix them up. And that hides the origin of the dirty money, right? So if ever an auditor were to come by or law enforcement were to come by, you could say, well, you know, we run something like the last frontier, right? And there's a couple of high rollers that came in, they lost a bunch of money. That's where the cash came from. And no one's the wiser to say otherwise. And there's actually a second facet of the casino business that the mob loves. It's called the skim. So simple to understand. They just skim a little bit off the top, but this is actually how it works. So you have this all cash business where people are gambling at the casino. The IRS has no idea how much money you actually make. And regardless of all the money laundering that you might be doing through this company, this in its own is an insane business because you're just under reporting what you make. So let's just say you pull in a million bucks, you skim off a quarter million, sometimes a half a million dollars, and then they just report that they made 500K. This is going to be a core tenant of the casinos from the 40s into the 50s into the 60s. It will later create problems for people when they buy casinos because you'll buy a casino in 1960, say you made this amount of money, which is like 5x what they claim to make in 1959. <laughs> and the IRS is like, what? What are you doing? How is this possible? Show me your books and your due diligence. And you're like, I don't know. Yeah. And so you can clearly see Vegas is very attractive for a couple of reasons. And it's in part because the legalization of gambling creates an enterprise, which is essentially like a platform for organized crime operations, right? You can use it to skim. You can use it to money launder. It's a great place situated to run narcotics, right? Like all of these things make it a great, great place. And one of the reasons why you know, Lansky and Siegel, who could be doing crimes in Brooklyn or whatever, like willing to drive all this way out just to see this guy running a motel effectively by the side of the highway in Vegas. And so what they're going to do over the next few years is keep coming back over and over and over. And they start acquiring more and more stakes in various sort of businesses around Vegas, right? So they take a stake in the last frontier and they've been operating for a little while and they start to think, okay, so what would happen if we built a casino of our own? But wait so a sec, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Before we go into this, we are now going to introduce one of the most important figures in 20th century Las Vegas. Basically, if you ever hit a point on the Las Vegas pop quiz, who is the person that did X anything? The answer is, Kirk Kerkorian. <laughs> and this is where we're going to introduce him to our story. Yeah, that's a good reminder. Okay, so let's back up. Like, So tell us who Kirk Kerkorian is. You should also tell us like why he's even related to what these mob guys are doing. Kirk Kerkorian, born 1917, Fresno, California. He's the son of a raisin entrepreneur. By the time World War II happens, he's going to be flying planes back and forth across the Atlantic, actually for the Canadian Air Force, and his love of flying will continue through the 40s as he goes on to refurbish and then resell planes. He's going to be based in L.A. And part of his business is going to be running a charter airline. One of his early customers, Bugsy Siegel, <laughs> flying to back and forth to Las Vegas for the weekend. So we'll pause on the Kerkorian story there. But remember this guy, because he's going to be around for a long time. Yeah, he's going to be around a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So like I was saying, <laughs> uh, the mob really pretty soon after kind of starting to take stakes in casinos and resorts and hotels in Vegas, um, pretty starts, soon starts shifting to the idea of building their own from scratch. And there's a couple of reasons for this, right? Uh, the first one is most of the kind of motels, hotels, casinos in Vegas at the time are kind of small operations. And so almost for keeping up appearances, it becomes necessary to make them bigger. Reason for this is if you're doing money laundering, right? You have a tiny, small casino. It will have to report that it's making millions and millions and millions of dollars in cash, even with the skim. And after a certain point, you know, that kind of facade is hard to maintain, right? So you almost need a, a front operation that can match the reported earnings that you say you're making. Right. Super key. Second one is that it's operationally better to vertically integrate, right? If you're investing in all these existing businesses, there's guys you got to push out. You have to manage through them. It's just not as good of a business, right? And so if you can vertically integrate from end to end, make it part of your criminal enterprise, way more efficient. Yep. 
Now, this will lead to really a period of kind of expanded growth. A lot of casinos will get set up in the time, but we want to focus for a little moment on um, maybe the sort of crown jewel of the New York syndicate's building spree in Vegas, which is a casino that's called the Flamingo. So Siegel uh, will be interviewed during the construction process and they'll ask him like, you know, what's your vision for this resort? And Siegel will be quoted as saying, the Flamingo is going to be the goddamn biggest, fanciest gaming casino and hotel you bastards ever seen in your whole lives. And even in modern terms, the way it's described is it's ridiculous. It's totally over the top. It's it's 105 rooms. So again, like we're evaluating all of these hotels by the number of rooms. 105 rooms. It will be budgeted at a million. That budget will quickly expand to two, three, four. It'll eventually end up at six and a half million. This is in the 1940s. They're building a six and a half million dollar hotel in the middle of the desert with 105 rooms. It will have a uh, golf, tennis, pool, uh, stables for horses, water feature, like all good casinos course, yeah, in Vegas will have a water feature. And for a brief period, they actually tried to fly to the Middle East and get flamingos for the Flamingo Hotel. Unfortunately, a couple of them died in transit. That didn't end up happening. Yeah. And the mob ultimately is on board, but they're getting worried as this thing progresses Right, quoted at a million. It's running five, six million. It's like also not meeting the the deadlines on when they want to open. And uh, Lansky gets a lot of pressure from the other investors, right? Other crime syndicates that have put money into this thing. And Lansky, you know, who is childhood friends with Siegel, they go way, way back. Um, basically, persuades them to hold off and say, "Stick with us. When this thing opens, it's going to be a huge success." Except it's not. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to have a tough go. So December 1946, it opens. It's not really even finished. Some of the Hollywood guests that they thought were going to get to go end up not going because it turns out Siegel and William Randolph Hearst, the LA Times, have a little beef. And Hearst essentially bullies slash blackmails some of those folks into not going, saying he's going to run negative press against them if they show up. Uh, not only is the party just like not really the success they want it to be, they lose a ton of money, like 300 grand in a couple weeks. And pretty soon, Siegel is going to have to resort to actually some innovations in Las Vegas money-making strategies, which will include cheap buffets, bingo, prize drawings, all of which are kind of new in the scene uh, to try and make money. But it's not going to be enough. Yeah. This thing is losing money, which is not what the mob wanted. And as so often happens in the mob business, when you lose a lot of their money and you skim a lot of their money, you get killed. <laughs> so Siegel in 1947 is shot in Hollywood. 20 minutes later, Lansky's lieutenants come in and they take over the Flamingo. And it continues to be run as a, a sort of mob front operation. Um, but sort of Siegel's involvement in the project is over. Let's situate where we are in history. The war has ended. We're in the 1950s now. The mob is continuing to pull in a huge amount of money through narcotics and illicit operations. Vegas is the place to process the money. Um, and it's a great place to do money laundering. And they've led to this huge kind of growth and building spree in Vegas. What you end up with is a lot of casinos that are fronts for the mob, but also competing as businesses, as casinos. And kind of the thing about the casino business is it's actually a really tough business because it's super commodity, right? So Craig, you and I have casinos. I've got Tim's Casino, you've got Craig's Casino. I've got roulette, you've got roulette. I've got poker, you've got poker, right? These are things that are really, really easy to copy. Mm -hmm. And the only way I can get an advantage in this game is if I come up with some distinctive reason why people have to come to Tim's Casino versus Craig's Casino. Mm -hmm. And what that means is entertainment. Mm -hmm. Over the 1950s, what happens is that there's just this arms race in casino entertainment in Vegas. And sort of the glitz and the glamour become a huge part of how casinos are able to compete in this game. And everything gets turned into a form of entertainment. And when Tim says everything, he means absolutely everything and anything. To call back to episode one, Los Alamos, the invention of the atomic bomb, there would be a Nevada test site about 100 miles away from Vegas. They would do the detonations there. 
you could see the mushroom cloud in Vegas. Vegas would capitalize on this as a marketing event, create a Miss Atomic Bomb contest at certain hotels. I don't know how they managed to pull this off, but it somehow works. People yeah. like want to get close to nuclear explosions to watch them. Yeah, totally. One of the best artifacts from this period is that the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce actually prints a little calendar that has the bomb test dates on the calendar, which are like, these are like military tests, <laughs> but Vegas in true style is like, and you can get a great view of it on top of Craig's Casino. <laughs> totally. This is also the era in which Vegas invents the Vegas residency, right? There's nuclear bomb tests happening nearby, but look, like I can put a sky deck on top of my casino. Craig's casino can put a sky deck on top of his casino. The advantage of being able to advertise, you know, Miss Atomic Bomb, very, very limited. All right, so next bit of competition. What we need to do is I'm going to bring someone that Craig can't get. And if I have a lock on that person for a period of time, that's a reason for gamblers to come to my casino versus his casino. So the one that really kicks this off is in January 1960, the Sands hosts a three-week sort of quote-unquote summit meeting that brings one of the biggest singers of the time, Frank Sinatra, and the Rat Pack. Mm -hmm. um, and they end up having this kind of thing where they sing, they perform, but they also just kind of hang around in the Sands. And this becomes a huge, huge kind of selling point for the Sands. It's a cultural flashpoint and is a major inspiration um, this is eventually the model that other casinos will use. So during this period, um, Elvis will start appearing. Liberace in this period will begin his 40-year run residency in Vegas. Um, this is really the moment in which, you know, the kind of secret weapon in casino competition is getting the celeb to show up and really kind of selling that as the distinctive part of ultimately the casino experience. People are there to gamble. And so now we have an interesting point in American history where maybe Vegas is the coolest place in the States. Like it's the place to see and be seen, which maybe previously it was like New York or maybe it was LA. And the thing about that is you start attracting certain types of people when you are then perceived as the cool place to be. Well, and to drill this point in, I mean, this is basically like, again, the mob has gotten this ball rolling down the hill. But on a certain level, if you're the mob, where this is all going is not great for you you've basically created a gigantic cultural bug light that is just attracting all sorts of different new people into the ecosystem of Vegas, right? The city is no longer as controllable as it used to be. And in some cases, you will attract a very, very big bug. Yeah, unfortunately, sometimes the very biggest bug, a man named Howard Hughes. <laughs> you've, you've probably heard about Howard Hughes. Yeah, right? totally. He's like, uh, he's in that movie, The Aviator. Yeah, exactly. He's, yeah, Leonardo DiCaprio plays him in The Aviator. I did not see it. Me neither. I haven't seen it. That <laughs> didn't make the research cut for this episode. But uh, however, the book, the Howard Hughes book that is, the movie is based on, very good. Could recommend. So Howard Hughes like kind of just like known as rich guy aviator, right? So how did he make money? Actually, the genesis of a lot of his wealth began with his father. So his father made a rotating drill bit for the oil and gas industry in the early 20th century, which he would create a company around. He would license a drill bit. And this just shot off tons of cash, which passed on to use. And then use would decide that, you know what? I kind of want to be in like a cool, really exciting industry. This is like the 20s. Let's move to LA. Let's be in the movie business. That's that's cool, right? That's where it's happening. He's also really into planes. So he shows up, tons of cash. He's like, I'm gonna make my own movie. I'm gonna make a war movie. Which is a great like rich kid thing is like, I got two interests. What if they were together? Totally. And also a great rich kid interest is like, what's the best way I can lose a ton of money? <laughs> I'm gonna make a movie. Uh, this is actually when sound is being introduced to movies, which is really interesting. And Hughes basically goes about compiling the largest private air force to shoot a movie that will be later known as Hell's Angels. So it's basically like a blockbuster. Uh, it's the genesis of, do you mind if I slip into something more comfortable? In production, multiple people will die because they're flying. There's no CGI, right? Like they're flying real planes. They're crashing real planes, sometimes intentionally, just to get the shot. So in the Hughes biography, which is by James Steele and Donald Bartlett, they'll describe the movie as this. 
Hell's Angels was rich in entertainment, low on philosophy and message, packed with sex and action. It launched the used legend. It's the flamingo of film. Exactly. It is the over-the-top flamingo of film. It's like you could argue is kind of like the first blockbuster movie. Mm. Hughes is also interesting in his personal pursuits. He'll become a world record-setting pilot. And because he's a rich guy with lots of money, he'll then go and start commissioning planes. Pre-World War II, he approaches Lockheed to commission a plane that can fly across the U.S., Without stopping, they'll start sketching it out. It'll be known as the Constellation. It won't get built during World War II. After the war effort, though, they actually make a bunch of these planes. Some of them end up in Europe, some are in the States. A couple of them crash. They're just like scraps as far as most people are concerned. Like insurance is going to write it off. And then this guy goes around and he starts buying the scraps. He starts putting the scraps together, and now it's a working plane. And this guy tries to then sell the plane back to Howard Hughes. Hey, Tim, I'll give you one guess who this guy is. Is it Kirk Akorian? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) He's back. He's trying to sell Howard Hughes design planes back to Howard Hughes. Uh, And Howard Hughes, actually, this will be very characteristic. He will try and stretch the negotiations out. To a ridiculous extent, Kerkorian will meet with him three, four, or five times. He'll be bickering about price. For a while, he was bickering about the size of the bathrooms in the plane. He didn't like that either. And Kerkorian's like, you know what, man? I'm not really interested. Which is interesting because that's a tactic, that like stretching of the of the negotiation that used us throughout his life. And he just like grinds people down because it's all he has. He's just like... He's a rich guy and he's bored. Yeah. He just negotiates forever. That's his strategy. Okay, so that's the background. Why is Hughes important to Vegas? Right. So Hughes is not only personally interested in flying planes, he's also in the industry, right? And he'll have a majority share of TWA Airlines and ultimately be forced to sell that share of the company, which results in the largest check to an individual ever. Over half a billion dollars. And this is in the 60s. So he's rich. And if you're a really rich guy, so you just got a half a billion dollar check, you got to spend that money somewhere. But first, you don't want to pay taxes on it. And that's his whole deal. That's so important. That's important. Yeah. It's like it's this the age old story of California having high taxes <laughs> dates back or to this time, if not way before. Uh, He will bring his kind of brain trust together as they figure out how he's going to dodge these taxes. California is going to lobby against him saying, pay these taxes now. Hughes, who had lived in Los Angeles this entire time, will say, I'm a Texan and I always will be. And California is like, no. (laughs) (laughs) And so he pays some of some of the bill. uh, But to basically transition all of this wealth into assets that he won't have to pay taxes on because it won't be holding as cash, he decides to get into the real estate game in Las Vegas. Las Vegas, yeah. And I think it's important, as we said, this big bug light has now been shown. It's this like radiating from Vegas. It's glitz, it's glamour, it's celebrities, right? If you are a reclusive millionaire playboy who can't stay in California anywhere because you know the income taxes are too bad, and you have kind of noped out of the Hollywood, Vegas is the next best place to go. So portentously, Thanksgiving week, Sunday, November 27th, 1966, at 4 a.m., Hughes and his crew show up and they move into the top floor of the Desert Inn Hotel and Casino. Like we've been talking about this time, if you're in a hotel or casino in Vegas at this time, the mob has a stake. And the Desert Inn is one of the longstanding cornerstones of sort of the mob's kind of operation uh, in Vegas. One of the principal owners is this guy, Mo Dalitz, who has been operating in Vegas for years and years and years. Um, And he's credited with being kind of a good businessman. He's a casino guy. And the headaches immediately start, right? It's Thanksgiving week. Um, This is a big time for the casino. There's a lot of money coming in. And this weirdo millionaire has just moved into the top floor, the best suite in your hotel. Not just the best suite, the entire top floor. Right. All of the rooms the whole, on the top floor. Yeah, exactly. 
and this is like the worst possible time for a weird reclusive millionaire to show up here at a hotel, right? Hughes at this point is quite eccentric. He is not leaving his rooms very much. This is like the worst possible customer. You need the big rollers in there during the holiday weeks, going out there, buying stuff, going to the casino, gambling, if you will. (laughs) This guy is just weirdly taking over the top floor of your hotel. Dalitz goes and they negotiate with Hughes' people to say, okay, you guys can stay, but please, please, please just be out by Christmas. Like, I'm begging you. Hughes just stays. And ultimately... Dalit says, okay, you guys have got to go, right? And Hughes counter offers by saying, how about I buy the entire desert in? This is like a big re- deal for a couple of reasons. The first one is Hughes knows that he's negotiating with the mob. He does not give a shit about that, right? And I think is a great kind of indicator about like what's going on here, right? Um, the background to some of this is that the mob is really under pressure at this point. Dalitz is himself has been um, indicted on tax evasion at this point. Um, and, you know, this really marks a period where the mob's kind of grip on Vegas is failing a little bit because they're om- under so much sort of sustained pressure by the federal government. The second one is that Hughes represents a very different kind of money getting into the game, right? This is not narcotics money. It's not skim money. It's not extortion money. It's just vast generational wealth driven by like oil and gas money. Yeah. And that this money is the kind of money that's going to start flowing into Vegas. You know, we said at the very beginning, in the early days, no one really wanted to touch casinos except for the mob. So it was easy for the mob to get involved. We're now a couple decades on and the norms are changing and people recognize that casinos are a great business. And so Hughes is kind of a signal of a new era, which is that he's bringing a different kind of money to the strip. The third reason is he's in it. He's in it for the love of the game, right? He came to Vegas mostly because it's glamorous, not because it's a great place to launder money. Um, and I think that also represents a very different kind of way of thinking about what the strip is even for and what all these hotels and resorts are doing. And to give you a sense of just how much Hughes is excited about Vegas, over the course of his time there, which actually doesn't end up being that much, just a few years. He will spend $300 million buying real estate in Las Vegas. So you got to kind of feel for Mo Dalitz at this point, right? This guy has been in Vegas for a long time. He's known as being a good business guy. He's obviously like a member of organized crime, but his real asset is the fact that he's just a great operations guy. He just knows how to run a casino. Hughes has basically just waved his golden wiener around and basically (laughs) said, I don't know anything about casinos, but how about you sell me the casino? And he will initiate the Howard Hughes deal-making strategy. Right. Which is that Hughes, again, is in it for the love of the game. He's not in it for the business. He has absolutely no pressure, having been just cut this check for a half billion dollars. And Hughes drags this negotiation on and on and on. And again, you kind of feel for the mob because they're just at the table being like, I've got so much pressure. I've got this huge headache. I'm just trying to run this business. Can we get this deal done? All the while, Hughes is doing some really weird stuff in Vegas. So famously, he really told his aides that he really loved this flavor of Baskin Robbins banana nut ice cream. Uh, His aides went out to go get it for him, only to discover that Baskin Robbins had discontinued the flavor. And so they they cornered the market on banana nut. And they acquired something on the order of 350 gallons of this ice cream, only to discover that Hughes was no longer interested in the banana nut ice cream. He, at the time, is like watching movies late into the night. And he buys a TV station to make sure that he can see the movies that he wants. Um, You really get the sense that after years and years of kind of the city being operated under you know, criminal, but quite sort of conservative kind of on the line sort of business making, right? A new kind of insane capital is just entering this system. And Hughes is just throwing money left and right and left and right. With no desire to really turn a profit on anything, but tremendous desire to control everything and kind of meddle in whatever's happening in Las Vegas in the 60s. Okay. The mob settles. They got to get out of town. (laughs) It's just not that great anymore. And so they ultimately sell the desert in. Hughes pays a pittance, $13.2 million, a tiny bit of his budget. And he turns to his aides and says, do you guys got any more of these toys? I want more. (laughs) That's a quote. That's a literal quote. That's a literal quote, yeah. (laughs) Hughes buys the sands, 
the Castaways, the Frontier. Um, famously, he buys a casino called the Silver Slipper because the the Silver Slipper in question, basically his big lighted sign, shines in through his hotel window and he can't stand it. This is really kind of, you know, in some ways, this kind of cataclysmic event, right? As Craig said, Hughes is not around for very long, but he basically is shaking things up in a very, very big way. So we told you to keep an eye on Kirk Gregorian. He's going to become a much bigger part of the story from here onwards. Um, And all this while, right, he's been working on planes. He's been flying Bugsy Siegel, right? He's been trying to sell planes to Hughes. Um, By this point, he's kind of a mid-level um, operator in Vegas. Um, he's the owner of a fairly, uh, influential casino in Vegas called the Tropicana. Um, one of the funny anecdotes about this is that, uh, Andre Agassi of tennis fame, his middle name is Kirk for (laughs) Kirk Gregorian. Of course it is. Of course. Right. And the, the reason being, which is completely wild is that Andre Agassi's dad, who is a boxer in the Olympics, he's Armenian, ended up being a waiter at the Tropicana and Krikorian, who's also Armenian, uh, met him there, and they formed a lifelong bond. Yeah. The guy's everywhere. The guy's absolutely everywhere. Yeah. Anyways, we introduce Krikorian again, not because of his relationship to Andre Agassi, though that is pretty interesting. Yeah. We introduce him because at this time, he's about to make a really big move and build a hotel called the International. He had purchased the Tropagana to like pre-train his staff for the International, where they'll later work which is gonna be a thousand room hotel. Right, so 10 times bigger than the Flamingo. Way, way, way bigger. And this kind of presages a lot of the Las Vegas we're gonna see when you think about Vegas as conference destination. Like a hotel that big, that's engineered for this type of thing. Howard Hughes finds out about this when Kerkorian is planning for it. And Howard Hughes announces his own bigger hotel idea hoping that he's just going to wash out the market and anyone who wanted to back Kerkorian is going to pull out because they're like, uh, Vegas doesn't have enough traffic to support all of this hotel. But Kerkorian pushes on and he, he gets some money together. He builds a hotel. Howard Hughes doesn't really do anything. He doesn't ship the hotel. All he really wants to do is kind of block Kerkorian and, and maintain his kingship in, uh, in Las Vegas. But uh, he'll eventually leave in, in short order anyway. Yeah, weirdly, he's scared away by the hydrogen bomb, actually. Yeah. So there's a test bombing that happens in 1968, not far from Vegas. He freaks out. Yeah, He's basically like, I don't want to live close to these bombs. He famously is like, I also don't want to live close to these unions, these minorities, this competition that I'm he's facing. He's not a great guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's very kind of thin-skinned. Uh, and so he, he picks up and leaves. He leaves the scene. And so Kerkorian will build the international and it's going to be pretty successful. This sets up an interesting dynamic because now we have sort of like infrastructure to support a growing Vegas, right? What I would say is it's got modern Vegas scale. It's huge, right? You can hold big conventions in it. Lots and lots of people from all around the country can show up, Yeah, but it's not modern Vegas in terms of entertainment, right? It's still based on personalities you come to the international because you want to see Vegas. It's not yet a place that you go to in its own right. Mm -hmm. The other really influential hotel during this time is classically Caesar's Palace. Uh, Importantly, without an apostrophe. Yeah, why is that? If it were Caesar apostrophe S, Caesar's Palace, that would assume that there's only one Caesar and it is their palace. Jay Sarno, the creator, was not about that. Caesar's Palace is where everyone's a Caesar. And that's like pretty cheeseball. But it's on the horrible. other hand, it's, it's <laughs> awful. Okay, I just really, it's awful. But really critical to what we're talking about, right? The era of the 40s and 50s is a very kind of like exclusive Hollywood kind of entertainment, right? You know, you had like these elite celebrities, Hughes is in town, right? Like one of the richest people in the world. It's still very much entertainment for the elite with a reputation that kind of emanates beyond Vegas's borders. The whole thing that's encapsulated in Caesar's Palace is where Vegas is going, right? Where the international means that anyone could stay here. Caesar's Palace is really about like, the entertainment is also for everybody. You can become come here and become part of the scene. You can become part of the fantasy. Um, and it's that kind of like democratization, that scaling um, that, that Jay Sarno is gonna pull off. And before we go into Caesar's, we should talk a little bit about the founder of Caesars, Jay Sarno. 
So Jay Sarno, born in 1922, serves in the war. Not quite as illustrious as Kirk Kerkorian. He ends up in Australia and not really on the front lines. He, more importantly, has a few side hustles going on where pilots would bring in alcohol, liquor, uh, and he would just sell it to Marines on yeah. the base. You're not supposed to do that. Yeah, I, I don't think you're supposed to do that. Um, a funny anecdote is he also had the mechanics working for him in his little side hustle where he would uh, slip them a little booze and they would grab him a spare part here and there, eventually compiling it all into his own custom made out of spare parts Jeep, <laughs> which he thought was great because it was untraced. It Technically, as he said, no one even knew it was there. So they couldn't take it away from me. <laughs> and even the officers didn't have their own Jeeps. So that's Jay Sarno. After the war, he decides to get into development. He'll start building these cabana hotels, one of which is actually still in existence in Palo Alto. And if you take a look at the photos of it, it looks just like Caesars, mm. which is kind of amazing. <laughs> it's like the, the precursor Greco-Roman style Big roundabout driveway. They've renovated it, but a lot of the stuff it's is like still there. It's clearly still like mini Caesars. <laughs> it's still a mini Caesars. Uh, the Beatles stayed there in the 60s when they played in SF. And this is kind of like early Jay Sarno where he's he's trying things out. He's painting and creating a fantasy for people in absolutely like a non-gender appropriate way today. He would essentially have talent auditions for the women that worked at his hotel. So you can kind of imagine this guy's vibe. He's a creepy dude. But anyway, the Cabana Hotels are the early ideas that Jay Sarno will then like stretch out to create Caesars. He'll visit in the 60s. As with every generation of Vegas entrepreneur, he'll look around and be like, this place is a dump. I'm going to make it better. And he has the idea to make Caesars. So he needs to get some land. He, of course, goes to Kirk Kerkorian. Kirk Kerkorian's got your land, bro. Uh, He raises some money, unfortunately, from Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters Union. So although Sarno will represent kind of a pivot to modern Vegas in some ways, in other ways, there'll still be kind of uh, illegal financing moves going on. There'll be the skim. Uh, You know, Sarno will have people placed via the Teamsters Union into the operations of the casino. However, we should talk about why Caesars was so amazing and wild. So a good place to start here is the opening party for Caesars Palace. So Jay Sarno fully intended to go over the top with everything about Caesars, and the opening night was not going to be an exception. You know, this guy had gone to Rome to visit St. Peter's And that's how he designed the entrance to the hotel. He was like, oh, this is great. Bernini totally had it figured. (laughs) And it's actually funny if you look at the photos, they're like, I I can kind of see. (laughs) No, I mean, I can at least see the inspiration. And then later on, Steve Wynn will be like, oh, wow, Sarno really figured out how to make something really cheap look fancy. But anyway, so with this Caesars opening night, Sarno had so many crazy ideas. Many of them were terrible. One of them was he had heard that uh, Roman emperors sacrificed live animals at important occasions. And so Sarno pitches his team. He's like, all right, guys, what we're going to do is in the main restaurant, we're going to have a big pool. It's a little classic water sure. feature. Yeah, big water feature. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's not just a pool. It's a pool full of piranhas. And at the opening ceremony, we're going to put a live pig into the pool and the piranhas are just going to eat it right in front of everyone. Fortunately, that did not happen. Yeah, which would have put a damper on the evening, I think. It still is extravagant, though, what they end up with. I think it's something like how many glasses of champagne? Like 50,000, yeah, something like and that. like literal tons of caviar. The invitation for the Caesars opening night will be described as an orgy of excitement that will go until either the participants collapse or sunrise August 8th, whichever happens first. And in true Vegas tradition, Caesars Palace has a water feature with a fountain that none other than Evil Knievel will jump over. Will fail to jump over more accurately. Yeah, well, he makes it over and then he kind of crashes and ends up in a coma for a month. really bad. (laughs) This is not great. His son will later jump over it successfully. All of this footage is on YouTube. So Sarno actually runs Caesars for only about three years. Um, But in that time, he builds it for $24 million and then sells it for $60 million. It ends up being a really profitable enterprise. And the key thing maybe that's interesting to know here is that Sarno is really an entertainer. 
he's not an operations guy. And there's these great stories about Caesar's Palace about to open up and like the floors aren't ready. A bunch of the rooms have like like the, the suites that the high rollers are going to stay in just don't have furniture in them and they're <laughs> rushing to get the furniture in before people show up. Um, and he's ultimately pushed out of Caesar's Palace because he's kind of incompetent and ultimately is under investigation by the FBI. But it doesn't stop him, right? He moves on to build a resort called Circus Circus. In pushing more middle market than Caesar's, Circus Circus is literally a circus casino. There are animals walking around. There are trapeze artists next to the slot machines. It's a literal circus. You'll have to pay to get in because the business model is pure casino. There's not even a hotel there. And actually one of the funny anecdotes about, about that cover charge essentially is that at the time in Vegas, poker chips were considered currency like around town. And so guests from the hotel would pay their taxi cab drivers, for example, in a chip. And then the uh, cab driver would show up at Circus Circus and be like, okay, I want to gamble. And they're like, yeah, give me two bucks to get in. And it's just like, what? What are you talking about? Why? And so it was just another example of Sarno diverging massively from the norm and kind of predicting some of the entertainment that people will want in Vegas when you look at things like Treasure Island and then like all the other more family-friendly, middle-of-the-road casinos. Right. Circus Circus fails. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it turns out that people don't want to gamble with literal elephants walking around them. It's like a, not a good gambling experience. Um, Sarno, at the end of his life, is planning a hotel resort that he calls Grandissimo. If you look at Grandissimo, it is basically the Bellagio. Doesn't achieve it. He dies before that happens. So Sarno will continually gamble everything to try and build these mega resorts. Uh, he was also a personally an insane gambler, a massive consumer of food and alcohol, dies at a young age, doesn't complete Grandissimo, but his mark on Vegas is massive. You know, he understood what people wanted to a larger extent than almost anyone else. We're in the 1970s and 80s now. The mob influence has declined quite a bit right? And this thing that they started, right? These casinos just competing with one another has given rise to something that's really, really different from where it got started, right? It is now much bigger, right? There's Kokorian style operations that are 10 times bigger than Siegel ever dreamed of, right? Um, there is crazy immersive entertainment that Sarno is kind of working on, but operationally unable to complete, and, you know, it's almost like a kind of dial, right? Like Vegas is kind of like tuning in to what's going to work, what model is going to work in the future. And it really needs to figure this out fast because what happens in the 1970s and 80s also is that other cities around the country are looking at Vegas and saying, wow, gambling is a great way to build up my city really, really, really quickly. And so I'm going to legalize gambling too. So this kind of unique edge that sort of Vegas had it for a period of time, which was basically, this is the only place in the country you can have legal gambling. It's got all of this like, you know, fantasy and, um, you know, pop culture relevance um, is kind of in decline. And Vegas at the turn of the 1990s, right, is kind of looking for its next move. So what's the solution to this competition, right? It's no longer Tim's Casino, Craig's Casino. It's Atlantic City versus Vegas. It's Vegas versus every other city that wants in on what Vegas has been able to unlock over the last few decades. And the solution turns out to be Sarno, right? The idea that basically Vegas is willing to spend more money than anyone else on pure extravagance and pure fantasy that no one's ever going to be able to catch up. And so while Sarno dies, you know, ultimately not living out his dreams of getting Circus Circus to work or the Grandissimo to work, it's a dream that kind of echoes on and inspires a new group of entrepreneurs. But why didn't it work out for Sarno? I think we can just see like the proof is in the pudding as he clearly was not an operator in managing his casinos. He was also incredibly distracted. They were filming a James Bond movie in Vegas at the time he was there, and he focused his energy on getting a bit part in the movie. He's actually there. He's in one of the James Bond movies with Sean Connery. <laughs> he's really, I mean, I think in some ways he's kind of high on his own supply, right? Like that he's like, he's in it and he's, he's clearly a visionary. He's able to get the money and get these things to work. But like 
he's in it for the love of the game in the same way that Howard Hughes is in for the love of the game, right? And at the end of the day, these businesses are actually quite good as long as you pay attention to the unit economics of running the casino, running the hotel, doing all the entertainment. Jay Sarno does not care about this. He's literally gambling with the house money at other casinos. He's under indictment. He's betting on the golf course. He's a disaster. He's a disaster. <laughs> yeah. um, One of the greatest anecdotes I love about this is a guy by the name of Steve Wynn, who we're going to talk about. Um, he was actually at the Caesars opening. And he tells this story about how he's checking into his room at the hotel. And there's a guy in the hotel on opening night installing like a, a shower curtain rod so you can actually even use the shower. And on the way out, the guy's like, well, at least your toilet works, right? This is all, almost Sarno is like almost pure showmanship. Uh, everything else is kind of by the wayside. It's kind of a mess as a business. And it's shocking how much he pulls off. But anyway, let's get to the point. Let's Steve Wynn. So Steve Wynn is going to represent a massive transition for Vegas. He's the guy that pulls together the showmanship of Sarno, the vision of Sarno, with the operational capabilities of a much more modern CEO entrepreneur to actually make a profit out of this place. And as to mention, Steve Wynn was in Vegas from a very, very early age. So he's just a student, I think, at Penn when he visits the, the Caesars opening party. He comes back. He gets in the game by buying some land off Howard Hughes, not Kirk Kerkorian this time. <laughs> Though at this time, he is a tennis partner to <laughs> Kirk Kerkorian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, let's not be confused. Kirk Kerkorian is still everywhere. <laughs> He's still friends. I think he calls him Stevie because uh -huh. um, Kerkorian at the time was probably like 60 years old already. And Wynn buys this piece of land off of Howard Hughes. It's a strange piece of land. It's a strip right next to Caesars. He ends up flipping it to Caesars which gives him the first amount of real capital in his life. And his next step is to actually start buying up some of the oldest kind of brands, the most neglected sort of casinos that are in Vegas. So he makes his name taking over uh, the Golden Nugget, which is a name that you probably heard us mention a while back in the episode, right? This is one that kind of opened up during the, the mob era. And he really builds his reputation there as an operator. So he discovers when he takes over the Golden Nugget that everything is super corrupt, right? Basically, like everybody's taking a little bit of the action. Essentially, everybody is doing um, the, the skim at every single layer of the business. Right. And so he's able to turn the Golden Nugget into a really highly profitable enterprise by sort of ruthlessly squeezing it operationally and eliminating a lot of kind of the, the sort of like culture of operations that had existed around a lot of these casinos, which dates back to the 1930s, 40s, and, and 50s. Eventually, Steve Wynn will leave Vegas and move to Atlantic City, where he's going to try his hand there. So this is, again, when Vegas is kind of in the doldrums, in competition with Atlantic City, it's unclear how this is going to play out, right? Atlantic City is close to New York. Who knows? In a different alternate history, maybe that's the spot. He won't last there too long. Eventually, he will move back to Vegas where he takes bigger swings. His recap of the time there is super interesting. He basically sums it up as Atlantic City wasn't willing to invest in the infrastructure like Vegas was with the airport, the conference center, the highways, all of that stuff doesn't happen. So he packs his bags and goes back to Vegas. And so now Steve Wynn is back with the Mirage. So a few things about the Mirage. The Mirage is 3,000 rooms. So now we are about uh, three times as large as the International and 30 times as large as the Flamingo. It is a $600 million investment, the largest that has been done to date. Also, it's responsible for the launch of such acts as Siegfried and Roy, right? And as iconic acts as Cirque du Soleil. And it also has water features, but more importantly, it has something that Steve Wynn will classify as a category three mistake, a giant volcano. <laughs> the reason being, when the volcano erupts, it's literally shooting flames out of tubes coming from the water. And when they planned it, they didn't think anyone would be so dumb as to climb into the water. And they were wrong. <laughs> and they were wrong. That nearly <laughs> happened in the beginning, the opening night of the Mirage. Eventually it gets fixed, but Steve Wynn would not build another volcano. The Mirage is Sarno, but with a real business sense. 
the Mirage ends up being incredibly, incredibly successful. And it basically demonstrates to the world at large, the investment community, that you can put hundreds of millions of dollars into this kind of enterprise and have it not be a circus circus style disaster. Uh, Wynn becomes incredibly wealthy off of the Mirage, and it starts off a wave of reworking uh, Vegas effectively in Sarno's image, right? Massively scaled, family fun entertainment, and most important of all, gambling. In 93, he'll open Treasure Island, which is a $450 million investment, and it effectively is the Pirates of the Caribbean ride from Disney World turned into a gigantic casino that you can also bring your family to. Similarly, incredibly expensive. And perhaps the most symbolic of this era is in 93, later in 93, October 93, Wynn will host a big party to demolish the Dunes Hotel. Wynn spends $1.5 million to demolish it and another million in fireworks to make it a real show. (laughs) It's a public event. It's a public event, yeah. The Dunes is demolished and it's replaced by the Bellagio, which as we said earlier is kind of Sarno's dream of the Grandissimo Hotel uh, really realized. Now, this is even bigger. The Bellagio is $1.6 billion as an investment, similarly 3,000 rooms and over 100,000 square feet of gaming space. And perhaps the pinnacle of the Bellagio, the thing you all may have seen at the Bellagio, is the Bellagio water fountain. It is the ideal version. It is the platonic Las Vegas (laughs) water feature. Yeah. What started in El Rancho becomes the Bellagio fountain. 1,200 nozzles, over 4,000 lights submerged underwater, five miles of piping, allegedly enough electrical wire to run between Las Vegas and LA. And at any given point, there are 17,000 gallons of water in the air shot out from the Bellagio water fountain. What I love about the Bellagio fountain is that it literally represents in hydrokinetics uh, what Vegas's strategy has become. Right? How do you win in a world where everybody has gambling and gambling is legal? Well, you're just willing to spend more than anyone else. Like the money is the moat. You're willing to engage in extravagance that no one else is willing to, and basically allows you to stay ahead of the competition. Right? Vegas is Vegas because it's Vegas. Like the brand is so strong and so distinctive, and that it's the only place in the world you can go to see things like the Bellagio Fountain. At the turn of the 21st century, Wynn is riding high, right? This is no longer Siegel's town. This is no longer Hughes's town. This is Wynn's city. He's had huge success. He's built the Mirage. He's built uh, Treasure Island. He's built the Bellagio. They've all been massive, massive successes. And he's riding the wave. Um, Vegas is, you know, sort of back on top um, against all of its competition. Atlantic City is kind of falling by the wayside, This is a great time for for Steve Wynn. But what's interesting is that while Steve Wynn is king of Vegas now, the things he's had to do in order to get there is making him incredibly vulnerable, right? When you raise two two plus billion dollars to build one casino, you got to raise that money from somewhere. And during this period, what's happening is that Vegas is sort of becoming a financial asset like any other global financial asset, which is to say that it's exposed to the capital markets. Wynn is now not just his own operator, right? He's no longer someone in in the Hughes vision, right, of just like, I just happen to be super wealthy and I'm building these fantasy casinos. He has to answer to Wall Street guys. He's got to answer to international capital. Um, and this is going to come to bite Wynn. So there's a great kind of infamous meeting where uh, Steve Wynn is trying to sell a bunch of his Wall Street backers on the dream of musicals being the powerhouse engine for the next generation of Vegas. And you could imagine if like a traditional Wall Street analyst was trying to sell this to other analysts, you know, you'd have a nice financial model. You'd say, well, looking at comparatives on Broadway, you know, this is the average TAM and this is why we should do this business. Steve Wynn just basically brings in a stereo, plays the songs from the musical, sways along with the music, and sings along with the music, and expects that to sell them. Does not work. Does not work. Um, And kind of his excesses will come to bite him. There's a period of time where Wynn's share price is down, um, and it creates an opening ultimately for... Kirk Kerkorian. To come in and make an offer. At 83 years old. At 83 years old, still kicking. Um, 
the epilogue of what is a long period of negotiation is that Kirk Kikorian, at the age of 83, uh, purchases Wynn's interests in Mirage and merges it with his MGM. There's a few aspects to that deal which are important. One of them is a, uh, the non-compete is removed. So Wynn almost immediately turns around and builds the Wynn Resort in Vegas. Um, and the other one is that Wynn himself, right, not one to kind of miss a chance to be the front man, has to announce the deal. Anyways, we want to give this epilogue to Steve Wynn, right? We could have ended the story at him being kind of king of Vegas, but we want to end it here because it's a real signal of how much the Vegas enterprise has become subject to like international flows of capital, right? That we're a long way off from the era of Siegel, we're a long way off from the era of Howard Hughes, which is independent operator, cash from probably pretty shady like places, um, making their own call as they see fit. And this is actually really critical because Vegas and the formula that Sarno started and that Wynn really kind of professionalized has now become rinse and repeat, right? And that Wall Street has kind of now taken it to the next level, where if you look at Vegas, right, it's actually not so much the Bellagio anymore. It's EDM, it's esports, it's UFC, but all of these still build on the fundamental template, right, which is entertainment extravagance being the kind of core engine of Vegas. But what is behind that now is less kind of individual impresarios, right? People like Sarno or people like Wynn um, and more people like private equity. So there's been a big history of private equity roll-ups in the last decade or so, where actually it turns out that a lot of these formerly independent casinos are now just portfolios of a much larger sort of set of financial assets. And that's really interesting, right? That it took successive generations, right? You know, again, Siegel, right? Sarno, Kokorian, right? Wynn to really figure out how to get this kind of weird desert economy to work. They just had to iterate on the product. That's right, exactly. And yeah. it only took about 100 years of iteration, <laughs> but now that they're there, it's become productized. And sort of what you see is that that product is now in other places around the world, right? So famously, like other major gambling destinations, um, you know, Macau, um, Singapore, right? These are all places that have actually like been part of this ecosystem. And a lot of Vegas's expertise now kind of backed with sort of international business in the form of Wall Street are, are now exporting Vegas to the entire world. And so kind of what you went from is a small town that started with no reason to exist to literally a template that is being replicated in places all around the world. All right, Craig. So the name of this show is almost impossible uh, we've done the Manhattan Project, we've done the Wright Brothers, and now we've done two whole episodes on Vegas. Um, is this an almost impossible thing? If so, why? Honestly, it was really, really impressive what they pulled off. Totally, yeah. I yeah. mean, to think about basically, you know, like the beginning part of the century, right, there being 13 people there. Yeah. And like kind of there not being a reason for a city to be there to what you have in Vegas today. Yeah. That does seem genuinely almost impossible to pull off in yeah. the sense of like if you intentionally tried to do it, right? Like, at, you know, in 1903, you were like, I'm going to build this crazy city in the desert. It would be it would be almost impossible, right? It would be probably just impossible, straight up. What's so interesting about it is how they chain together this like Walt Disney World fantasy, but because they kept doing it with like just a little bit bigger, just a little bit bigger, just a little bit bigger, they ended up with this thing where it's like kind of you know the pot's boiling and no one notices, mm -hmm. and everyone just kind of. I, and we did talk about Wall Street being a little bit critical, but they're still hearing out Steve Wynn, right? It's kind of insane that we're all now bought into this being okay, right? Right. Well, and that's the thing that we just like accept it as a feature of the American landscape, yeah. right? Like, I think if you like started a list of like what's like the most American stuff. Right. You'd probably at the top of the list, I don't know, it'd be like stuff around D.C., you know, like, oh, the White House or yeah. like a Declaration of Independence. But I think pretty soon after you get to like Vegas, right, it's just like this completely improbable thing is now just like part of like the cultural landscape of the U.S. For sure. Well, let's use I mean, like let's use the Manhattan Project and Wright Brothers as kind of like two poles. Yeah. Right. Like, do you think like Vegas is similar to any of these things or are they just like totally different? Right. I think we're just evaluating such different types of, pro like mm -hmm. we, we zoomed in right on specific projects mm -hmm. for the earlier episodes. Yeah. And now when, if you think about episode three and four, you know, Hoover Dam and the strip, 
as this, this Vegas, this bigger thing where, I mean, the thing that comes to mind actually for me is like Silicon Valley mm -hmm. or an entire, like an ind like the building of an industry. How does one build an industry? That's right. Yeah. That's what kind of makes Vegas sort of an interesting category here. Right. Is like, we could talk about like, I mean, the Hoover Dam, right? Like that's like, that's like, I mean, mega project, right? Like very much kind of like in the vein. And I think, yeah, maybe that's a really interesting way of thinking about it is like the Vegas story is actually a Vegas is like, it's the story of like a, the maturity of a kind of way of doing business, right? And like, for example, we could have done that with the Wright brothers, but we only took the Wright brothers initial slice. Right. This is almost like if we did an almost possible episode about like the history of aviation yeah. or something like that, where you really get to see like, oh, well, you got the Wright brothers and then you got Hughes and then you got, you know, and, and then so on and so forth. Right. Um, and so it's almost like we're almost talking about like almost impossible projects as like Vegas is really the story of like a series of almost impossible things, right. Happening in succession. So let's talk a little bit about like, could you repeat this and like the kinds of people that are involved in doing this? Right. Because like, you know, I think we joked on the last, uh, episode, like imagining like Orville, Wright trying to start El Rancho is like just a silly idea. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I think it's like sort of interesting to think about like the types of personalities that you need to do city almost impossible projects versus like a plain impossible project. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think those are actually like really different types of people for sure. Yeah. So what's your take? Well, for one, they're terrible, right? <laughs> like I think like what's, that's, what's really interesting is I think like you can ask, Vegas allows you to ask the question, how much does it need to be illicit? How much does it need to be, um, you know, like the only place in the country where you can do gambling for a yeah. period of time to get Vegas style growth so quickly, yeah. right? To basically go from like no one in the early part of the 20th century to millions of people at the end of the, end of the 20th century, yeah. you sort of maybe need like some pretty ruthless folks yeah. uh, who are in it for kind of shady reasons, right? Like, so there's obviously organized crime. They, they kill people. They're like mostly in this business to make lots of illicit money. Um, but also it's like, you know, Sarno and Wynn are not great guys, right? Like, Wynn is eventually, like, a bunch of accusations, very legit accusations of sexual abuse come out, and he's he's thrown out of his operation as a result. Yep. Um, it's these guys that create this uh, reputation for Vegas, right? Like, I think what was the cool, one of the interesting out, uh, outcomes of episode one, right, in this series is like Vegas gets its reputation because it's where all these workers want to go to blow off steam, right? But then that kind of like dream that rep becomes like something that gets packaged and sold to the rest of America in the 1940s and 50s. And a lot of it is like, hey, this is kind of like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And like, you know, that's all about like image. It's all about like, you know, you know, I think we characterize it as sin in the past, but like, you know, the attractiveness of Vegas for a period of time is like a talent in like building that dream. Um, and, you know, that has some neg very negative consequences for sure. Yeah, I mean, just yeah. objectively negative. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of this like, they're role playing for better or worse, almost all of these traits, right? Yeah, that's right. And I think that's kind of the interesting thing with like the Hughes and even the Sarno case, right? Is basically like, okay, we're going to create this kind of like, competition between casinos it gives rise to the rat pack but then like like we said like the bug light there's people who come who are like sold they're like that's the dream that i want right and then they're willing to spend huge amounts of money to try to like make it a reality yeah. and so at a certain point like that kind of like thin sort of like marketing vision yeah. becomes like reality yeah and like i think again like you know, there's this kind of interesting question about like the the skill, if you will, that like allows you to pull this thing off, right? Because I think it's quite different from like a science skill, right? Though I, I think interestingly, it does have kind of these like Wright brother echoes, right? Which is like constant iteration almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are all kinds of forks that have gone off. Obviously, in you know this one hour to our episode, like we're not covering the entirety of Vegas. Mm -hmm. There are interesting innovations too that happen around casinos, right? So Harrah's, which we didn't really cover in the episode, Harrah's will be the first one to do, sort of do analytics on its gamblers. Yeah, so I think that's the first element that kind of sets the innovators, if you will, of Vegas, like apart from some of the other people that we've talked about, right? Like is like, 
they're terrible guys, but their terribleness is kind of also the image that they're selling. Mm -hmm. And their talent is in like building that dream. Mm -hmm. I think the other one, which is pretty interesting to me, is that like they're really basic. <laughs> like that's the thing about Steve Wynn that I think is fascinating is like he's just really into musicals, right? And then like this thing with EDM, right? Like I think you were telling me he's basically like, yeah, the kids are into EDM. Yeah. It's what the people want. That's why we're in the business now. I don't really get it, but like that's what it is. Yeah, there's a great interview with him on YouTube. There are actually a bunch of interviews with him on YouTube. And uh, he says exactly that. And I think he says something to the effect of, in my generation, we wanted to see the show. And in this younger generation, people want to be in the show, mm -hmm. which right. is in effect the like the mega Vegas club. That's right. Yeah. And I think that's like kind of like this like very median taste is also, I think, something that's characteristic of a lot of the kind of like players that help to bring Vegas to the masses. Yeah. Right. And it's quite different from like like Oppenheimer. Yeah. Right. Oh He's God. like, I'm reading poetry. I'm hanging out in Berkeley. You know, I, I hang out with these like cloistered circles of quantum physicists in Gottingen. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, in some ways, like one of the reasons why Oppenheimer is great for his role is that he's like a total outlier, right? And these guys are really interesting because I think like, yeah, maybe talent wise, they're outliers in some ways, right? Because they learn how to, they know how to run the casino business. But like in terms of like taste and temperament, they're like really basic, but that's also what makes cities successful. Yeah. Like they're mass appeal. Like New York is mass appeal. Some of the almost impossible projects we've talked about are like, you're trying to build this like singular thing yeah. that requires you to be kind of a weirdo. Yeah. Like the Wright brothers are like, they're kind of weird. Definitely. Right. But like here you are building a, like a singular thing, which is Las Vegas. But like in order to make it successful, your, your target market is just has to be so much bigger. Yeah. And so it means that the kinds of people that get involved, like are cut from like a super, super different cloth. Yeah. It's like to a T all of the stuff too. Right. right. Like Steve, Wynn, we didn't really get into it, but he, he gets into buying art. And he's like buying all the stuff you expect, the Picassos he's hanging. He actually ends up destroying, a, allegedly destroying a Picasso by when he's walking around it was at his office or his house or something. He does this wild gesture and like puts a hole in one of the Picasso paintings that he later has to like sell at a loss. Um, but it's all the, and like, you know, they have, uh, you know, they have their own yachts. Uh, Kerkorian's one of those guys also who's like got a mega yacht, right? <laughs> uh, they're into all the things you're like golf. They have their own private planes that they'll then abuse for like private use. It's like yeah. literally everything that you imagine as like maybe a veneer of success. And they, they are actually, you know, financially successful. But like that whole look, like playbook, American, median, I want this, I want to be the Caesar uh -huh. mentality. Yeah, yeah. That's all that they're about. And I don't think they're faking it. No, I don't think so either. Yeah. Well, this is a great segue because I think we've consistently talked through both episodes about like the contemporary yeah. city building projects today, right? Which is kind of like in the, the background of all this, right? Like the contemporary almost impossible project is, could we build a city today? And Vegas is like a great template because it's like a really fast growing city, mm -hmm. right? It went from zero to 120, you know, in basically no time. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? My takeaway after, after all of this has been that you probably could pull it off. You could take a lot from the Vegas playbook uh, and just to kind of enumerate the Vegas playbook, that would mean uh, giving it a place, a, a reason to be. Uh, so that's probably some kind of big employment project, uh, affordable housing, uh, and then to build a city that's generally attractive to a lot of people by making something that's like universally interesting, uh, median taste to get the most pot, like the biggest TAM. I think you could do that. I think that's totally possible. Maybe who knows if it's in the U S but you could totally do that. However, given the kind of highbrow, you might say pretentious mentality of a lot of these city projects, I wouldn't bet on many of those building another <laughs> Vegas. Yeah, I think one of the most interesting things that crossed my radar is like, so there's the city building projects that I'm sure a lot of our listeners are familiar with, right? Like these kind of projects that emerge out of like people who have been in and around the tech sector. Yeah. But there's this really fascinating news story recently where uh, Donald Trump in a recent speech yeah. <laughs> announced that like he too really wants to build a set of freedom cities that are essentially like these charter cities. Um, and I'm kind of sitting there, I'm kind of looking at like, yeah, like unfortunately, like let me just say that unfortunately, 
he may be well more well positioned to build the next Vegas, the next successful, rapidly growing city, because two things. One of them is basic taste, right? And then I think the other one is that like he is building an image, which is almost like really critical to like going to an outlier city, right? Like I think one possible thing is like we have all these city building projects. It's possible that like the pointy headed ones will only get cities to like a certain size, right? Like you'll basically have Vegas after or like right at the cusp of World War II. Mm -hmm. Not bad, you know, like people live there, like they have works, like they live their lives there. They've got jobs there. You know, you have a military base opening up, like it's a great, you know, economic place to be. But its ability to kind of create this like outlier black swan city, I think requires like a certain set of talents that go beyond, right? Like, like just creating like the basics for a city to form, right? Totally. It's about like the the image and like the hype and like also like in certain level, like unless there's a reason for people to be there, like the spectacle, like to create something that people want to travel to go to. So I think the final thing that might be good for us to talk about is like almost like the meta narrative, right? Um, you know, if there's one criticism that I have of how we tell some of the stories on Almost Impossible is that I think we are very individual focused. We're character focused, right? So we told the story of the Manhattan Project, which is like a city scale project through Oppenheimer. We tell the story of the Wright brothers, right? Which is like these two guys. But it's true that, that those two guys also relied on an aviation culture, a whole set of like weird guys doing like kind of like backyard experiments and flying. And same thing, certainly in the case of a city, right? Like the story we've told is kind of like an elite story, right? Which is like a couple of players who all literally know each other. They all know Kokorian, yeah, yeah. right? Is kind of the reason why Vegas is the way that it is. Yeah. Um, and I think it might be worth for us to just talk about, like, particularly as we kind of think about how we want to tell the next episode, which is perhaps this problem X100, yeah. right? Like, do we think that's an accurate way of telling this story, right? right? Or, like, how much of it is a simplification? Why is it important to tell the story this way? I don't know if you've got thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it's ultimately, it's like the great man version of history. Sure. I don't know. Where do you fall in this? Yeah, I think... So the answer, like most historical things, is that like it depends, right? And I think what's really interesting is that in the Vegas case, we have an industry that is so insular yeah. that I think for a period of time, you can kind of make the argument that like while there's lots and lots of people who will be impacted by what happens, right? There's all these other people living in the city at the time who are working for these hotels and like those stories exist, right? Like it is really incestuous Sometimes it's incestuous because it's like really criminal. So all these guys are like kind of operating in this like small circle of trust. Um, and not every city works like this, but I do think that at least in the Vegas case, it does seem to genuinely capture something about what's going on, right? Like that for a period of time, one of the richest guys in America is just sitting on the top floor uh, like of the Desert Inn doing crazy things. And the whole city is kind of like, you know, influenced by that. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be the case in any city. And I think in some ways, like that story becomes harder to tell as Vegas grows and grows and grows. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I do think that in the casino case, like it has, the city is very unequal mm -hmm. and our narrative reflects that in some ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I put a vote in for like, you know, not every city is a great man city, but Vegas might be one of those places where it's not just great, but also like great, terrible men right, right, are right. kind of like what's building the city right, right yeah. yeah i i would i think i would tend to agree for for some of these like transitionary moments mm -hmm. because i would say does vegas need to exist you know we talked about like does a city need to exist mm -hmm. you're like okay fine then we make the hoover dam and we have boulder city and we have some infrastructure and you could imagine a place sustaining itself there sure. um but I would argue that without this chain of people who want the glitz and the glamour of Hollywood, but they also want the gambling and they also want the Bellagio for some reason, like without those people wanting to push it forward, I think the average outcome you probably get is something like more like Reno. Mm -hmm. Like you have a gambling place for sure, but do you have the crazy Disney world by default? Like I'm not convinced. Yeah, that's right. And I think part of it is also that like Vegas, 
has the kind of company town aspect, yeah. right? Like obviously in more recent years, it's one of the fastest growing suburban areas in the country. There's like a lot of other industries and things going on in Vegas, right? But this like core initial powerhouse of the city, which yeah. is gambling, yeah, right? You know, almost we're almost telling like the story of like an art form in some ways, right? Which is like, how do you get this casino business resort fantasy thing to even work? And like you're saying, I think one of the most interesting aspects of it is that like these guys are almost like they're less ahistorical than tech people. Like tech people are like, we just invented this thing. You know, we call it uh, like we call it the convenience store. And people are like, you just reinvented the convenience store. Right. But like here, I think what's so interesting is that like literally like Sarno looks at the Flamingo and he's like, you know, he critiques it, right? And like each kind of successive iteration of these gigantic facilities is kind of a direct sort of like response to like this kind of like evolving, I hesitate to call it an art form, but certainly like this thing that they're creating. Yeah, yeah. And, and like the crux of that, which you already mentioned, at least in the image, is tourism, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like the biggest buildings in your city are tourist destinations. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about like how one person impacts the image of a place, when all of these things converge around building a company that is then marketing this place, when it's all optimized towards that one specific thing, you have your like you have your angle as your hotelier, and that is the thing for this whole city. I think that's how it happens. Like that is how Vegas happens. That is specifically how a tourist city happens. But can you run that for a normal city? I don't think so. Yeah, that's right. And I think maybe that's kind of a fun way of reversing it, right? Like we often talk about like great man theory of history as like, what's like, what's the absolute reality of history? Does it turn on like these incredibly insightful people? You're almost flipping it on its head, which I really like, which is basically like in order for Vegas to work, it has to create like certainly the image of great men, but also economically it seems to create like these these figures, mm -hmm. right? Because you like need the person in the control room to like pull off this completely weird like theatrical tourist Disneyfication, you know, of the city. Mm -hmm. um, and like not every city works like that, right? Like probably, uh, and there are cities I think that you can consider like more multinodal, right? That like, because it relies on a couple different industries or because of the nature of industries, like power is kind of like more spread out. And so like the city doesn't need this like character building, right? This role building. Cause it certainly, it's in the case, like in the, in the kind of Rat Pack era too, right? Which is like, there's lots and lots and lots of entertainers in Vegas, right? But in order for Vegas to become like a nationally marketed product, they have to be like, Frank Sinatra, old blue eyes. He's like the classic, that's Vegas, right? You know, and we even did it as a shorthand. We're like, oh yeah, all that Vegas stuff that you know. Yeah, yeah. And we can do that shorthand just because like the city has been so good at like distilling it down to this completely artificial, like great person, great actor, great, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think in some cases there is a reality to that because like the the business requires it. Right. It's like Vegas makes a meme of itself. Uh -huh. And then that meme, I mean, like, I think maybe the, the best example is the Elvis impersonator. Uh -huh. Like that is literally invented, obviously, in Vegas. Uh -huh. And right. for whatever reason, we're all just like, great, thumbs up. That's yeah. great. Keep it coming. That's right. And like, and we're okay with it. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because you can extend it even further, right? Which is like, is that true of other types of innovation that we've talked about, right? Like, does the creation of the Manhattan Project like assume a great man at the helm? Right. Right. Because the government for a period of time needs like an Oppenheimer they can point to and be like, science man, what do we do? Right. And so like almost like even though atomic science didn't have to work like this, yeah. it was constructed to have this person at the helm that would like pull the lever and do the <laughs> thing. But like it's almost like arbitrary. Like you could have designed that program a couple different ways. That would be the argument. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think it's a fair argument. And I also say like, we're obviously incredibly biased because the most entertaining way to tell the story is like yeah. throw a bunch of characters in here. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think I fall more on the side of believing it with this story. Mm -hmm. So sort of in closing our first two parter, first two part episode on the, the creation of Vegas, the creation of a city, the creation of the Hoover Dam. Maybe it's like kind of interesting to to ask ourselves like why did we even choose <laughs> yeah. 
this. Why did we embark on such a crazy attempt to compress all this history into two episodes? Seriously, because yeah. it's like, you know, from the outset, in the beginning, we're like, okay, we have the atomic bomb project. Oh, that's like definition of like science, like American might in the 20th century, like fine. Uh, invention of the airplane. That's wholesome. That's a science thing. But like, what? Vegas? Like we kind of snuck the Hoover Dam in there. You're like, okay, there's an infrastructure. Yeah, you project. get a bonus mega project. Yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which right. was yeah, that was a great little bonus goodie bag. Um, but really, why? Yeah, I think what I'm always trying to do here, and what we're trying to do, is kind of see the the meta, right? Because I think the really intriguing thing is through all these explorations, are there like common principles for all these almost impossible projects? And I think the thing that kind of got us to Vegas was really three features, right? Whether you're talking about the invention of flight or you're talking about the atomic bomb, right? You're talking about something that had a really big impact. You're talking about something that happened really, really quickly. And you're talking about something that was like unprecedented. Those are three really, really big aspects, right? And what's interesting about that is you take those three and you're like, okay, well, one thing that obviously fits into there is big invention, right? So, you know, you have the atomic bomb, right? Big impact happened really, really quickly and like unprecedented. You take the Wright brothers, right? You're like big impact, the invention of flight happened really, really quickly. Two guys working over like a series of years uh, and completely unprecedented, no one pulled it off. And you're like, okay, but like those apply not just really narrowly to like moments of big invention. They also apply to like things like a city, right? Big, huge impact happened really, really quickly and unprecedented in some ways, right? And I think, you know, maybe like, that's one reason we ended up with Vegas. I think the other interesting thing that we ended up with Vegas on is that unlike the Manhattan Project or the Wright Brothers, right? Like I think the project of Vegas is like a series of like unintended consequences. Like it's just like this pinball machine. The ball's like flying around mm -hmm. and it's like, oh, Hoover Dam. Oh, like workers, you know, worker town, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, Vegas becomes like a place where they, you know, hang out on weekends, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, the mob, you know, it's just like, I think what's really different about it is that it's like a much more uncontrolled version mm -hmm. of like these kind of three meta topics that we've been talking about. And now, so we're thinking about our fifth episode and we've chosen to finally leave the US for this one. And we think it actually will fit all of these three criteria. Yeah, and to be clear, I think we're gonna follow an almost impossible tradition and try to get a nuclear bomb reference, a plane reference, and a gambling reference all into this upcoming story. So you, you should, if you're listening, you should keep us uh, to that. The next episode is going to focus on the euro, the creation of the euro, the distribution of the euro, and the consequences of the euro. Again, it fits our three meta categories. Huge impact, enormous impact, <laughs> out of control impact, bigger yeah. impact than even maybe Vegas. Yeah. Right. <laughs> even Vegas. Yes. <laughs> Really, really fast, right? In historical terms, right? Um, talked about for decades, but again, on kind of like a, a global historical level, really, really interesting and, and rapid process. Also, in some ways, pretty unprecedented, right? For all these independent states with their own currencies to merge together and create a common currency union. And so an important contrast from like the tabula rasa of the desert Las Vegas we now have histories, we have currency, we just have thousands of years of economic systems, and we're gonna try and meld them all together. And ultimately, the thing that gets us interested is the unintended consequences, and there are a lot of them. <laughs> so, see you next time for the creation of the Euro. <laughs>